to use the, use the Q&A. So it's my great pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Emma Kovac today to, to speak to us. She's got up very early in California to, uh, to talk to us today. And uh, I was aware, made aware of Emma's work from uh, seeing a, a preprint, which I've also put the link to in the, in the chat there. It came through some sort of social media channel. I can't remember exactly where, but uh, it was great to see it. And then we thought that this would be, you know, it's highly relevant for, for plant ed and it would be great to, to hear what she uh, has to say on this and, and the work that has been done on this. So um, as you can see, Emma works for the Breakthrough Institute and I have no idea what the Breakthrough Institute is, but she is gonna explain all that now. Um, so yeah, so Emma is gonna speak for 35, 40 minutes or so, and then we will have uh, a good, at least 20 minutes for, for questions afterwards. So please uh, think of questions as they're going along, uh, write them in the Q&A, and then we'll get back to, we'll put those to Emma afterwards. So so thanks so much, Emma, for, for attending, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my name's Emma Kovac. Thank you for inviting me to speak to this group. I think we have a lot in common. Um, and I'll be talking about research that I did with Mateen Keim and Dan blastine Rato um, on the climate benefits of yield increases in genetically engineered crops. And this is research that we posted as a preprint on BioArchive. Um, and BioArchive wants me to tell you that it has not been certified by peer review. Um, and it is in review at a journal right now. So... Um, the Breakthrough Institute uh, is in Berkeley, California, which is where I am right now. And we're a nonprofit policy and research center. And we aim to identify and promote technological solutions to environmental and human development challenges. And we're divided into two programs. We have a program on food and agriculture and a program on energy and climate. Um, and I am on the food and agriculture program. And a little bit about my background. I got my PhD in plant biology. And during graduate school and after, I have so far spent about six years in both education and policy surrounding genetic engineering. And my current role is senior food and agriculture analyst. And I specifically work on the role of biotechnology in solving environmental problems. And the food and agriculture team at the Breakthrough Institute, mainly like one of our main focuses is how to grow more food on less land, um, because we think that's a really powerful way to meet rising food demand, while also minimizing the amount of land that humans need to grow food and leaving plenty of land for nature. And we designed this study to fill this gap in the literature that we identified, um, where the impacts of genetically engineered crops have been measured in more than three, but three main ways that I'm gonna talk about. So that's including increases in crop yields that happen based on genetically engineered traits and how those impact farmer profits the environmental and health benefits of reduced pesticide use that comes with insect resistant um, genetically engineered crops, and then uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions and fuel use from reduced tillage, which comes from herbicide tolerance traits. But what's missing and what we aimed to provide with this study is emissions associated with land use change for genetically engineered crops. And I'm gonna explain what exactly that means. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar. But to give you a preview of our results, we found that if the EU grew um, genetically engineered crops, specifically herbicide tolerant and insect resistant traits, that there would be a 33 million metric ton, tons of CO2 equivalents decrease in emissions, which is equivalent to about 7.5% of EU agricultural emissions annually. Um, and that statistic is from 2017. Um, so now I'm gonna explain what this connection is between land use change and greenhouse gas emissions. So the main principle here is that uh, world population is rising as is food demand. And if we can uh, pair an increase in food production with uh, yield increases in crops, 
then we can reduce the need to convert new land for agricultural use. And that is also known as the Borlaug hypothesis. And on the right, I'm kind of showing you that in graphical form. So on the top, you can see just a representation of baseline agricultural production. There is some crop production on the left. There is some natural vegetation remaining on the right. And that could be forest, could be grassland um, or wetland. And so the emissions associated with production in this situation are production emissions, which come from inputs to agriculture like fertilizer, um, fuel for tractors. And then on the bottom, we have three situations of um, what could happen with increasing global demand for crop production. So if that increasing demand is paired with yield increases, which is shown on the right, we have less land use change. And if it's paired with no yield increases on the left, we have uh, more land use change. So when land is cleared for agricultural use, like we see on the left, we get land use change emissions. And um, additionally, with an increase in production area, we also see an increase in production emissions, which is the, uh, the blue arrows and the red arrows. And then on the right, um, we can see that if this increase in demand and production is paired with relatively high um, uh, yield increases, then we could completely avoid um, land use change for agriculture. Um, and in reality, it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle where we have to clear some additional land on a global scale, um, but not as much as if there were no yield increases. And um, this, of course, is a simplified representation because usually land use change and land sparing, which is what we call um, sparing land from conversion for agricultural use, usually happen in different locations. So this is really happening on a global scale through connections between production in different countries um, that kind of respond to changes in one another. And if we look at a historical example of this, um, this is global land under cereal production from 1962 to 2014. And on the bottom, we can increase, we can see how much um, land under cereal production increased globally during that time. And that's about a 20% increase. And that 20% increase would have been much larger if there had not been increases in cereal crop yields over that same time period. So if there had been no yield increases, there would have been a increase in land under cereal production on a global scale that would have been 13 times larger than it was historically. And that would make up about uh, more than doubling of land under cereal production globally. So yield increases have really spared a lot of land globally from um, being converted for cereal production to meet present day demand. And then if we think about the emissions associated with land use change on the scale of the global food system, you can see on the right that about a third of global food system emissions come from uh, emissions associated with land use change. About a third come from food production, which is represents mostly on farm processes. And then the last third in the upper left that's kind of broken up into various bits um, is mostly off farm processes like packaging, um, transport, and then disposal. Um, and so land use change makes up about a third of the emissions from the global food system. If we look at global agricultural emissions, which would eliminate those off farm processes like packaging and transport, then land use change emissions make up almost half of global agricultural emissions. So they're really very significant, which is why we aimed to measure them for genetically engineered crops. And to give another, um, this is kind of a hypothetical example. If we look at the bigger picture, of course, land use change emissions aren't the only thing that matter when we're looking at the environmental impacts of agriculture, but there are gonna be 
always trade-offs between the amount of land use change that happens and other environmental impacts. So in this kind of simplified example, if we think about increasing fertilizer application to fields for some kind of crop, um, that can often help increase yields. And as I've just explained, um, an increase in yields can contribute to a decrease in land use change emissions. But of course, there's going to be other impacts, one of which would be an increase probably in runoff of fertilizer from fields, which can damage waterways and the organisms that depend on that water. So there's um, you know, pretty clear trade-offs here between increasing yields and um, impacting other environmental uh, impacts. And of course, those trade-offs will uh, vary depending on what kind of management decisions we're looking at. But the point here is that we need to make sure we're measuring all of these impacts so that we have a full picture and can make an informed decision. Um, and as I've said, many of these impacts have already been measured for genetically engineered crops. And so we're trying to fill in this picture with this additional uh, element of land use change emissions. Um, and then just to make sure this is clear, our analysis looked at um, genetically engineered crops and traits that have been around for quite a while. But um, this analysis that I'm going to describe could be done with yield increases um, that occur in gene edited crops, because really crop yield increases due to any mechanism have these climate benefits in terms of a decrease in land use change emissions. Um, so the research method that we used um, is from Searchinger et al. from 2018, and it's called the Carbon Benefits Calculator. And um, this was a method that they published um, in, in an article where they used it, um, and it's published as a, a large Excel spreadsheet. Um, so it's really open source and a method that anybody could use. And so in order to calculate the greenhouse gas emissions impact of yield increases in genetically engineered crops, we chose this method because for a few reasons. Um, the first reason is that it contains the smallest set of assumptions. So other models that we looked at that we could have used to answer this question, um, one category of models is called partial equilibrium models. Um, and those depend much more on things like um, global trade relationships between different countries, which are of course subject to change. Um, and this method that we use, the carbon benefits calculator also has more transparent assumptions because they're all laid out in this Excel sheet that's very accessible. Um, and so because of this smaller set of assumptions, our results are more generalizable. Um, they depend less on um, all of these specifics about global trade relationships between countries and rather look at kind of a global average. And so that allows us to provide a baseline estimate that uh, people could always go back to and make more specific for particular um, situations. So the carbon benefits calculator method depends on this concept of carbon opportunity cost. And carbon opportunity cost is defined as the opportunity for land to store carbon if it's not used for agriculture. And this is calculated based on the carbon that is lost when land is cleared, because um, of course, global agricultural production is continuing to, to expand, even though production is um, contracting in some areas, um, globally, there's still a large amount of expansion on average. And the amount of carbon that is lost when land is cleared um, is influenced by the carbon stocks that are present in native vegetation. And this method takes into account carbon that is both above and below ground. And on the right, you can see um, a, a map of carbon present in native vegetation um, across the world. And this is um, uh, 
uh, an input that the, that the model uses to calculate the carbon opportunity cost for productions of various crops on average around the globe. And the other element of this um, method is production emissions, which I mentioned at the beginning, which are just associated with inputs like fertilizer um, and other energy inputs like uh, fuel for tractors um, or maybe uh, electricity if a farm is more electrified. And so our method um, takes into account both carbon opportunity cost of production and production em emissions that are associated with, um, with production. So the scenario that we used for this analysis um, was we looked at what if the EU had grown five genetically engineered crops with existing traits at high levels of adoption in 2017? And under that scenario, to what extent might greenhouse gas emissions have been avoided? And this included just existing herbicide tolerance and insect resistance traits in the five crops below, um, which are canola, uh, otherwise known as rapeseed, um, corn or maize, soybean, cotton, and sugar beet. And those are um, crops that are grown at relatively high levels in countries that grow a lot of genetically engineered crops. Um, and these traits have been around for a while. So there is uh, kind of an accumulation of papers that looked at yield increases based on these traits. And we used um, estimates of those yield increases from a meta-analysis by Klinkber and Keim from 2014. And um, they, they looked at this globally, um, but the estimates that we're using are averages for temperate zone industrialized countries because um, the impacts of this vary in the tropics, for example, because pest pressure is often higher, um, and also between countries that are more or less industrialized, because that usually impacts the amount of inputs like herbicide and pesticides that farmers have access to, which impacts how well um, pests and weeds are controlled in those areas. And so we used an average yield increase associated with herbicide tolerance traits of 6.5% and 9.7% for insect resistance. And to compare this to um, kind of historical changes in yields, um, if we look at change between 2010 and 2019, um, on average across the EU, we see yield increases between four and 11% for these five crops. So it's lowest for canola at 3.7% and highest for sugar beet at 11%. Um, so these yield increases are like relatively significant when you compare them to yield increases that happened over about a 10 year span due to changes in breeding and changes in management historically. And to kind of lay out the, um, the logic behind this method one more time, um, it assumes that if yields of these crops increase in the EU, then total EU production will increase EU imports of those crops will decrease because more is produced domestically and production and related land use change and emissions from production of those crops elsewhere in the world will decrease. And um, this shift in production um, towards the EU and away from other countries globally can enable greater carbon storage on land elsewhere that is spared from conversion that would have otherwise, otherwise been cleared if um, the EU had not uh, like increased uh, production and contributed to this global increase in production. So if we look at our results on a per hectare basis, um, we can see that maize has the highest total potential avoided emissions under this scenario. Um, and maize and cotton come first, partially because um, for quite a while they've both had stacked herbicide um, 
tolerance and insect resistance traits available, whereas for canola, sugar beet, and soy, um, only herbicide resistance uh, is available as a single trait on a large scale. And um, if we look at the bars that are divided between the top and the bottom, the top is net avoided emissions from carbon opportunity cost, and the bottom is from production emissions. So we can see that um, the potential avoided emissions from carbon opportunity cost are much greater than those from um, production emissions. And so that I just want to underline the importance of including carbon opportunity cost when we look at the emissions impacts of um, changes in yields. And some other um, components that go into kind of the difference between the different crops and their potential avoided emissions per hectare are um, the total yield increase, which is due to the traits available in that crop. Um, average yields of those crops in the EU uh, compared to the rest of the world production emissions in the EU compared to the rest of the world, and then the carbon, uh, the carbon stored in native vegetation um, on average across the EU compared to the rest of the globe. So these are potential avoided emissions per hectare. Um, if we look at total potential avoided emissions, this is just the per hectare emissions from the previous slide, um, basically multiplied by the total area on which these crops were grown in the EU in 2017. So you can see that maize really dwarfs um, all of the other crops and then canola is the second highest. And that is the ranking of these crops changed um, in large part because maize is grown on by far the largest area across the EU and canola um, is grown on the second largest area. And then cotton, sugar, beet, and soy are on much smaller areas. And then if we add all of these up, like I told you at the beginning, um, this adds up to 33 million metric tons of CO2 equivalents in potential avoided emissions. And that's equal to 7.5% of EU agricultural emissions from 2017. And to put that into context more, that's equal to about the yearly emissions from 10 to 20 coal-fired power stations. So it's a pretty significant um, emissions reduction. And to talk about um, a few more of these assumptions that are part of the model that we used and that are part of our analysis. The first, which I've talked about quite a bit so far, um, is the assumption that an increase in EU crop yields would lead to a proportional decrease in production elsewhere in the world, otherwise known as the Borlaug hypothesis. And we do know that on average, crop yield increases do have a land sparing effect. That when crop yields increase, globally on average, um, land use change for agriculture and land clearing decreases. This, uh, the magnitude of this effect can be difficult to predict in a specific situation, but we are looking at a global average, which mitigates that impact. Um, and some factors that uh, influence how much uh, the, the degree of this relationship, so like how much land is spared when crop yields increase, some things that affect that relationship are whether the crop is a commodity crop or a staple crop, um, whether it's traded between countries to a large extent, um, whether the yield increase happens on a smaller scale or whether it's um, on a larger scale, whether it's impacting the whole country or multiple countries, um, whether the yield increase is in a more low or high income country and whether it's due to technological change um, or other factors like climate. Um, and then the second assumption I want to talk about is that an increase in GE crop adoption in the EU would not affect other countries. Of course, this isn't true. Um, it's a simplifying assumption in the model because we can only look at one region at a time. Um, likely uh, an increase in genetically engineered crop adoption in the EU or genome edited crop adoption in the EU would 
uh, increase adoption in other countries. And um, not only would it increase adoption in other countries, but it would also probably increase the availability of different traits. Um, which brings me to our third assumption, which is that we only used existing uh, traits in genetically engineered crops. And of course, more traits than that already exist and have for a while, and more are being developed. And with uh, conducive policies in the European Union, of course, that would impact research funding and the development of genetically engineered or genome edited crops, particularly those that are most suited to EU countries. Um, and you'll notice that wheat is a crop that's grown widely across the EU that's missing from our analysis. That's because there aren't any uh, GE traits that are grown basically worldwide right now. Um, so that's potentially something that would change in the future that would have a large impact in quite a few countries. And then relevance of this to the EU, um, besides what I've already shared, as an EU audience, you all probably know this better than I do. Um, but the farm to fork strategy is part of the European Green Deal, has a goal to increase organic production. I think it's to 25%. Um, and we know that on average, organic crop production has lower yields. Um, and as I've explained throughout this presentation, um, uh, and a decrease in yields, which is the opposite of what we modeled, we modeled an increase in yields, would um, cause an increase in land use change globally. And likely through trade relationships that would offshore environmental damage to other countries. And as you all also know, as gene editing people, um, gene edited traits can increase crop yields and that can then mitigate land use change. And if organic production allowed the use of genome edited crops, that could have, of course, also increase yields within organic production. So my take home message is that we absolutely have to balance the environmental benefits of reducing input use, which um, is usually part of organic production, with the greenhouse gas emissions cost of decreasing yields under organic production. Um, and we can balance those in different ways, but we should at least have all of the information in order to make those decisions. And uh, if we look at a comparison between the results of our analysis and a study that looked at organic production, um, this is Smith et al. from 2019. Um, on the left, you can see emission savings due to adoption of genetically engineered crops, just these existing traits in the EU, the results of our analysis. Um, and then on the right, you can see the results from this analysis by Smith et al which um, modeled a complete uh, expansion of organic production across England and Wales. So obviously this is um, an expansion to 100% organic production versus the 25% goal in the farm to fork initiative. Um, and this study just looked at England and Wales rather than um, all current EU countries. And if we look at a specific example that includes current trade relationships, um, the EU in total uh, imports a lot of maize for animal feed. And a lot of that maize is genetically engineered and almost half of it comes from Brazil. And EU average maize yields are actually about one and a half times as high as maize yields in Brazil. Um, and if we look, oh, and uh, the EU makes up about 12% of Brazilian maize exports. So it's a good, good chunk. Um, and then if we look at EU maize imports from Brazil, which is about 5 million tons a year in 2019, um, compared to EU domestic maize production, which is about 14 times higher. If EU domestic uh, maize production increased by 7%, um, then the EU could completely replace uh, Brazilian maize imports um, with domestic production. And um, the yield increases that we've been talking about 
Um, the lowest is a 6.5% yield increase based on adoption of herbicide tolerance traits. Um, so that 7% increase in domestic production isn't so hard to believe. Um, and of course, we all know that Brazil is undergoing a lot of deforestation of um, the Brazilian Amazon. Um, and a lot of that is driven by production of soybean and maize. Um, so the impact of <clears throat> uh, deforestation in Brazil, uh, in the Amazon, is really high compared to deforestation elsewhere in the world, um, where carbon stocks and native vegetation are lower. So if we go back to um, these takeaways, that again shows us that yield increases can have really big emissions reductions associated with them. And that can then have a global impact because of um, interrelationships between countries via trade. And of course, um, there has been kind of a hopeful development in the EU um, with the European Commission study on genome editing. Um, and you all would know better than me, but this uh, seems really promising uh, and the beginning of probably a long process of revising regulations that relate to um, genetically engineered and genome edited crops. But um, I feel hopeful about it. And I think that this last example of Brazilian maize imports really gives us an idea of the impact that a change in regulations could have um, on a global scale in helping uh, reduce climate change. So that's all I have for you today. Um, if we don't get to your questions or if you think of additional questions, uh, my email is ecovac at thebreakthrough.org and you can always um, go to the Breakthrough website and find me on there as well. And now I'm looking forward to a discussion and answering any questions you have and hearing feedback. That's great. Thank you very much, Emma. Yeah, a very interesting talk and I think it will provoke plenty of, of debate. <laughs> so, yeah, indeed. So, Dennis, do you want to take the first few questions? And, and Sure. Uh, there's been a number of questions um, in the Q&A that are quite specific, but I will try to summarize. There are some, some, uh, some questions that relate to certain details of your manuscript. Uh, uh, an attendee who has uh, read your manuscript with great interest and um, has a few, a few questions about it, but I will try to summarize it a little bit. So, it's a little bit about... Um, uh, the, your assumptions. You showed a slide with some uh, some of the assumptions you have for this study, and uh, but there is um, um, well some of the questions they relate to the possible overestimation, saying that uh, um, it probably possibly overestimates your carbon benefits, but perhaps also the yield benefits because uh, um, some of the assumptions, for example, on adoption, are based on what is happening in other countries and not really in European countries. And also, um, it is based on uh, the agricult agricultural context in other regions. So you have to take into, into account uh, uh, region-specific uh, context, uh, such as pest, pest pressure and so on. Uh, so do you, do you have any comments to that? Yeah, so one thing that we did, which you can see in the methods of the paper, I think, um, is we did a small sensitivity analysis. So we varied um, the level of adoption of the genetically engineered traits in crops in the EU. Um, and we also varied oh, the, um, the yield increases that are associated with those traits. Um, so we varied, uh, I think I have a slide on this. We varied um, adoption um, between 50 and 85%. So if you go all the way down to 50% adoption, um, then the total potential avoided emissions goes down to 17 million metric tons. And then also if you um, look at the yield increase from stacked herbicide tolerance and insect resistance traits, and you just bump that down to the yield increase from uh, the insect resistance trait alone, then the total goes down to 25 
million metric tons of CO2 equivalents. So um, yeah, we this like I said, this is kind of a baseline estimate that's obviously based on um, some of these assumptions, but one could always go back and change those inputs based on more context specific information. But um, you know, it's this is a retrospective analysis because the model is based in the year 2017. Um, so we needed to use data from uh, the past. And of course, um, if the EU starts growing genetically engineered crops, that will be happening way into the future. Um, so some of these inputs will, of course, change. Um, and it's possible that they'll update the model for um, more current years, which would help. But yeah, so I guess my answer is, uh, of course, rates of adoption uh, affect the total potential avoided emissions. Um, and hopefully this kind of range of adoption levels gives you a sense of how much that would matter. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, I think your data could, should be a powerful incentive for European policymakers to actually consider um, authorizing some crops. Because as, as you mentioned in the abstract also, that the, uh, it's an assumption based on, well, it's, it's, uh, reflects what, what would happen if, if the European Union would adopt at the same level as in other regions like the United States. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. If you look um, globally at like the top four countries that grow genetically engineered crops, 85% is kind of the bottom range if you look at these five crops. So adoption is really high in those countries, but of course it's been increasing over many years. Yeah. Yeah, so let oh. me, yeah, so, so we have a, a comment more than, than a question from, from Jonathan Gressel. Uh, and who mentions about uh, canola and the fact that uh, canola has an increase in, in CO2 emissions um, because of the methyl chloride and methyl bromide that it produces. So do you have a, do you have a comment on that? Or do you want to comment on the comment or is that something you're aware of in your analysis? Um, I've definitely heard about that. It's not part of our analysis. Um, that could be incorporate, well, I guess I don't, I would have to look into the, um, the details of the model assumptions more deeply than I have in a while. Um, but it's possible that that's uh, incorporated um, in the production emissions section, but I'm not sure. So it might be part of it. I, I could look into it. Okay. okay. Um, and then, so uh, Rude is asking about, do you have a lesson here for, for gene editing in the future of Europe? Um, so insect tolerance is not, in GM at least, is not so feasible by gene editing. And then herbicide tolerance might be possible in some cases, but there's issues with public perception. Um, I mean, well, you can read the rest of the question there. So do you have a lesson that, you, that might be applicable for the future? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one thing that, you know, I always like to tell people when I'm talking about genetic engineering that you all know is that, um, all of these studies on past traits, herbicide tolerance and insect resistance give a very limited view of what's possible. Um, it's of course possible to increase crop yields <clears throat> um, by many different mechanisms. And I think that, uh, yeah, it helps for people to have a more expansive vision of that. You know, there are um, really interesting um, traits, some of which are genome edited, some of which are genetically engineered um, that are increasing uh, photosynthetic efficiency, um, which can increase yields uh, under, even under stressful conditions. Um, and then things like drought tolerance, you know, as climate change continues, um, extreme heat uh, and other weather events are going to increase. So yields are really, um, you know, uh, responsive to those events. And so there's, you know, really a wide range of traits that, that can impact yield. Okay, so we have a question from Peter Rogowski. He asks about, so generally, more generally about land use change, how much land use change has there been in Europe over the last 10 years? Do you know, do you know that? Mm, I don't have a figure. I know <clears throat> that it's been decreasing and there's even, I'm sure as you all know, been uh, significant reforestation. Um, so I don't have a number, but um, it's of course important to think about, like that's also true in the United States that land use change for agricultural use has decreased. Um, 
I think there's been less reforestation than in the EU. So, you know, in industrialized countries um, that have been increasing crop yields, um, that's a really promising trend. But we also have to think about this on a global scale, um, that even though land use change is uh, decreasing in countries like the US and in regions like the EU, um, that's absolutely not happening on a global scale. And um, especially with areas like the Amazon that have a ton of carbon storage, it's really important to think about how to reduce that deforestation. Um, and you know, it's even easier to reforest a temperate forest than to reforest the Amazon. Um, so on a global scale, it's still a really big problem. So let me ask a question about the, I'm intrigued about the genesis of this study. So why is it that the Breakthrough Institute was involved? How did you get involved with this? You know, from Facebook, you're obviously US based, although mm -hmm. thinking globally, but this is obviously focused on the EU. So why did you uh, take on this project, this challenge? Yeah, so <clears throat> we, um, I think we were looking at like what data is missing for genetically engineered crops. And we saw a really good match between um, this lack of estimates for um, emissions associated with land use change for genetically engineered crops. Um, a really good match between that and this method that was published in 2018. And then we focused, I think we're going to be doing more of these studies, but we focused the first one on the EU um, partially because, uh, because there is such a low level of GE crop adoption. Um, that we could uh, create a kind of historical um, uh, situation, I'm forgetting the right word, um, to compare with, um, and that that would be rather a clean comparison. And then also because of the EU Commission, uh, the European Commission report that was coming up, and we were hoping that this would kind of add to that conversation and give people more information to work with. Dennis, have you got a, another question? Have you got anything you'd like to ask? Yeah, um, it was, uh, well, I was, I was just going to uh, challenge one of your assumptions. It's not a real, it's not central to your study, but it, you do mention it in the introduction as one of your assumptions. And it's saying that, um, uh, most uh, part of the background information saying that uh, a higher adoption in the EU uh, would likely uh, lead to an increase in adoption also in, in you mentioned Africa and Asia. I would kind of uh, challenge that assumption because uh, as far as I know, I don't, I, I don't know really if there is any evidence that the European Union has such a strong influence on countries in Africa and Asia. And actually we are seeing, despite very restrictive policies in the European Union, uh, we do see that there are certain African countries who are already adopting um, uh, genetically engineered or genetically modified crops at some level. We see it in Kenya, in Uganda, in Nigeria. We have commercialization already uh, previously in Sudan. We have it in South Africa. We had it before in, in Egypt and so on. So um, it's a kind of a, it's an assumption that is commonly heard, but I like to challenge it whenever I can. <laughs> so I don't know if you have any comments. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, yeah, I when I was uh, researching kind of the inputs to this model, um, I was looking for papers that actually kind of tried to quantify any impact that uh, policies in the EU would have on um, policies in other countries. And I found a couple of things, but I agree that it's not as, um, it's not like solidly shown. Um, it's a hard thing to, to prove um, or to kind of show that impact historically. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's an important assumption to challenge. I think that based on a couple things I read, yeah, I don't have any numbers, but I do think that there, there is some impact. Um, you know, like South Africa um, has been growing GE crops since the 90s, um, but these changes in other African countries are much more recent. Um, and I do think that these global trade relationships really do do impact those changes in regulation, but it is a really hard thing to find evidence yeah. for. Yeah. Okay, so we have a, a question from Jonathan Jones here in the UK. So if 
if you had an increase in if you had an increase in soybean yield by however whichever method, um, would this reduce the land needed for soybean production and reduce deforestation, deforestation, or would it make soybean even more profitable so it could <laughs> provide a, a stronger economic driver for deforestation deforestation in Brazil? Yeah. So okay. So if EU <clears throat> Uh, soybean yields increase, um, then that would potentially decrease the demand for um, soybean exports from Brazil. Um, of course, many other uh, countries and areas of the globe uh, import soybeans from, from Brazil. So that would just be that. Um, I don't have a percentage for um, Brazilian soybean imports to the EU. Um, but they're also very significant. Um, so the interaction between, um, between yield changes, kind of like I said in one of the last slides, the interaction between yield changes um, and the amount of resulting land use change, and land use change is often driven by how profitable it is to grow a crop. Um, those relationships are complicated, but on average, um, crop yield increases do do decrease um, land use change, um, which is often through um, a reduction in prices. So I think we could potentially see um, that an increase in soybean production in the EU would decrease uh, demand for exports from Brazil, which would then um, potentially decrease uh, the profitability of growing soybeans in Brazil. Okay. Is there nothing else coming through in the Q&A? Uh, Dennis, do you want to? No, I can't see any more questions in the Q&A, and I, I keep an eye on the chat also. There is uh, nothing for the moment. Okay. Yeah, if there is nothing for the moment, maybe allow me one comment. Of course. Yeah, also, um, that, uh, the, it's, it's true, as you say, that the European Union is currently uh, has started a kind of a process to look into options to, for legal reform. Uh, to, to update or to revise the GMO legislation to some extent. I would say, though, it is very unlikely that this will have an effect on uh, transgenic crops. Uh, what it could possibly have an effect, effect on is on, on uh, certain applications of directed mutagenesis, for example. As a possible medium to long term outcome, we could see, hopefully, some uh, deregulation of. Uh, products of directed mutagenesis. Transgenesis, not likely. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, not a question, just a comment. But if you please fill in, please uh, comment also. Yeah, um, so, you know, with the, the um, relatively recent change in regulations in the US, um, we're just kind of starting to see how that plays out. Um, it basically reduced regulatory barriers for um, genome edited traits. So basically SDN one and two um changes and in some of the regulations it's also defined as changes that are possible through um conventional breeding which those don't like always line up but um that's definitely a pattern that we're seeing worldwide that regulations um tend to have a lighter touch with most genome edited traits um and and still maintain pretty heavy regulation on transgenics and Personally, I don't think it makes sense. I would love to see regulation um, that's truly just based on the trait that is created, um, however that happens. Um, but I don't really see that changing anytime soon um, in the EU or the US or even Canada kind of just went the opposite way. Um, so I think that that is a pattern that we're gonna be seeing for a long time, unfortunately. Um, rather than regulation that's kind of more truly based on the product that's created. Um, and of course, that impacts the kind of traits that, that we can make. Um, but I do feel really hopeful about um, kind of combinations of improved photosynthesis and stress tolerance. Um, and also when those are combined with, um, you know, like yield partitioning um, in grain crops in like modern cultivars of grain crops has kind of reached a maximum. Um, but that's really not um, so much outside of, I guess, wheat, maize, and maybe soy. 
Um, but people are breeding uh, cultivars of rice that have increased yield partitioning. So if you have increased photosynthesis and increased yield partitioning, then you can really get a big jump in, um, in the grain yield um, from crops or the harvested yield. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's, that's gonna be a pattern worldwide and scientists, uh, which I'm no longer a lab scientist, are gonna have to work around those regulations as they always have for past regulations. So, so let me finish then. Um, I may be having a bit of an insight into the process you're going through of moving this study from bioarchive into a peer-reviewed journal. So we've obviously got some nice questions and there's some assumptions which might um, trouble some reviewers and the like. So how is, how is that process going without giving away any um, secrets, of course, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so far we haven't gotten reviews back. We're still waiting yeah. on reviews. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but we do have a practice of sending our studies out for kind of informal peer review, um, particularly for things that we're not planning on eventually submitting to an academic journal. So some of those reviewers have brought up the same, the same questions that uh, some people have brought up in the questions today. Um, and so there are a couple of things that, um, you know, we can't change anything yet, but that we have in mind and that I think we'll probably hear from from the formal review process as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. This is the, the beauty of, of bioarchive, right? You get to <laughs> test this prior to 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 uh, peer review. So, um, okay, so it's great. I think we can we can end it there. So thanks very much, Emma. And and as you said, you're you're more than welcome to take questions from from people. And and you can see the the questions we had in the chat. They're quite specific ones from from Graham in particular. And we will pass those on to you. And you could have a maybe you can have a. a a back and forth or, or offline uh, about about those uh, suggestions that he brought up because I think they're very helpful um, for you to improve the study or change the study or whatever. Um, so just to remind everyone who, who's still here that this will be um, posted on the uh, uh, Plant Ed YouTube channel over the next few days um, and then we can um, you know so please pass it on to any of your, your colleagues who might be interested in this as well so um, so I can say thanks so much Emma. Dennis have you got any final comments before we go? Yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And yes, yeah, so, well, I can just remind everybody about uh, the next webinar also, which is on the 10th of June. It's going to be really interesting with uh, four speakers, uh, a little bit longer. I think we have uh, set aside one and a half hours for that one. Yeah, four shorter presentations about the impact of uh, gene editing technology. Okay, great. Right. Yes, we'll look out for that through on our website, through email, and then on, on social media, of course. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so thanks everyone for, for attending and thanks, Emma, for present. Thank you, Emma. Cheers. Yeah, thank you so thanks much. Thanks, Ryan.